Good morning. Welcome to your living room or your bedroom or wherever it is that you're watching this. Or welcome to Tulsa Bible Church Online. My name is Daniel Newberry. I'm the Family Ministries Assistant here at TBC. And I just wanted to start us off by saying welcome to our new church online platform that we've got going on amid this COVID-19 pandemic and whatnot. I also just want to make a few quick announcements so that you guys kind of know what we're doing here at TBC. First of all, all facilities are closed until April 6th. We're following basically with what the public schools are doing. That's what the elders have decided. So public schools are closed. Tulsa public schools are closed until April 6th. So that's what we're going to do as well. Facilities are shut down. So if you try to come here on Sunday or Wednesday, good luck. You're not getting in unless you got a key, but you're not getting in. All right. Facilities are shut down. Second thing, we are putting together a community care team because it, while facilities are shut down, we still want to be able to serve you. The whole body wants to be able to serve each other and love each other. So we're putting together a community care team of members of the body who want to set aside their time and their resources to help those who are especially hindered during this coronavirus pandemic. So if you're someone who has a hard time getting out of the house or you're especially um, at risk with this virus that's going around and you need grocery runs, or maybe you need help with something around your a property or something. I don't know. Whatever it is, if you need help, you can still call the church or better yet, call Scott Susong, and we will get someone from our community care team over to your place to help you out. Uh, kind of touching on that idea of serving each other and loving each other, I wanted to kind of just give a quick little exhortation, if I may. So if you just want to look in your Bibles, which Hopefully you got them because we're not on vacation and we're still doing church. So if you get your Bibles down, look in the book of James. Um, James writes his letter to a group of believers who are dispersed abroad and they're living in isolation similar to kind of what we're doing right now. While they were, I mean, they faced a lot of persecution that we may not understand and their isolation is probably on a grander level. But still, we can take what James says to them about this whole being dispersed abroad, the same exhortation he gives to them, we can take to ourselves. Because we're living in quarantine right now, everybody in their own home, social distancing. We're not getting together as the body of Christ. Something about that face-to-face -face communication that is so special that God created, that is so encouraging among the members of the church, it's gone. I mean, right now, we don't have that because face-to-face -face communication is what the problem is with this virus. And so this, this whole idea of the body getting together is being hindered. Unity is being hindered. The encouraging of one another is being hindered during all of this. So James writes to these believers who don't get to come together because they're isolated, and he gives them an exhortation. And he says, he actually says, consider it joy, my brothers, when you encounter various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance and let endurance have its perfect result that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. This time of isolation amidst this pandemic is, is, a, is pressure on us as the body. The question is, how are you going to respond to that pressure? Are you going to let that pressure produce stronger faith within yourself? Or are you going to crumble under the pressure? That's my exhortation to you and my encouragement is to let this time, this testing of your faith, help you to actually grow in your endurance and grow in your faith. So that way you can be closer to Christ, even though we as the body can't be close to each other. At the end of this chapter, uh, in verse 27, he, he explains this is what strong faith that, that withstood endurance looks like. He says, this is pure and undefiled religion in the sight of our God and Father to visit orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself unstained by the world. So we got our community care team to reach out to those who are in distress, those who can't help themselves in our body. But there are people who don't have a church body because they're non-believers. They don't know about the love of Christ and they also need help. So my encouragement to you is to let this time of pressure and testing of your faith to produce a stronger faith inside of you and let it shine. Let, let, the, let the love and righteousness of Christ shine to your neighbors who are lost or maybe they are believers, but they just don't have a church to help them out. And go to your neighbors, those who need help or someone you can pray for. See what you can do to help them out. I know a lot of people in our church are already doing that and that's, I think that's just so awesome. So that's my encouragement to you guys. Um, let this testing of your faith produce endurance. Uh, let me pray for us really quick, and then we'll be done here. Gracious and Heavenly Father, thank you for this time that you've given us. Let us uh, thank you for being so good and so sovereign in control of everything. Um, I pray that as we move through this, uh, as we go through this pandemic and this intense time, we pray that you would use this to build us up and to shape our hearts to look more like your Son and to show the love of your Son to the world. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.
suffering not for a moment did you forsake me not for a moment did you forsake me not for a moment did you forsake me Well, good morning. It's great to see you guys online this week. And just before we begin, I want to say a big thanks to everybody that's been a part of making this production possible to, to do some kind of form of, of church, of teaching, of encouraging and worshiping online this week. Um, two guys especially want to mention is uh, Brian Shute for allowing us to use some of his technology and giving us some help there. And also Mark Gullickson for just creating a lot of time, uh, taking time out of his week to to offer this to you and to be a, a big part of our worship in the body of Christ. And uh, we're just really, really grateful. And so as I start this morning, I'm just going to pray and we'll jump into Mark chapter 14. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, just thank you so much for um, your goodness to us, God. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for your mercy that is new every morning. And even in the midst of a, of a difficult time for our city and around the world, Lord, and people, several people just suffering and going through heartache, um, we are so grateful for your goodness to us and your grace. God, you are good in good times and you are good in bad times. Um, I just pray that the services that are taking place on video uh, here today and that people are going to take a part of would be enriching for their life. and. Give them a good contact point for the body of Christ, where we just love everybody in our church family. They're so precious to us, and it's hard to be away, but it is so good to be able to contact and uh, stay in touch in some kind of way. And so we pray that this service would glorify you in everything that is said and done. And we ask this to you, Father, through the Son and by the Spirit. Amen. One of my favorite short stories was written by Robert Louis Stevenson, and it's called The Strange Case of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. And Dr. Henry Jekyll is a kind, well-respected scientist. He experiments with the duality of human nature. Uh, Jekyll, in every, every word and every respect, is a man of character and dignity. He is an honest man, and he has a good reputation. Um, but he is, uh, and, he, and he's trustworthy. But dealing with the duality of human nature and um, just this, this thought that sometimes we seem to be functioning well and sometimes we don't, he had this evil alter ego called Mr. Hyde. And Dr. Edward Hyde was everything that Henry Jekyll wasn't. He was repulsive in every sense of the word. His character was diminishing and evil. Uh, the things that he said, the actions that he committed in the story were just totally the opposite of Dr. Henry Jekyll. And one character describes evil Edward Hyde in this way. He says, the man seems hardly human, the mere radiance of a foul soul. And if ever I read Satan's signature upon a face, it is on that of your new friend, Mr. Hyde. The story In the story, Dr. Jekyll and, and Mr. Hyde, uh, Dr. Jekyll creates this potion and all he wants to do is separate himself from these two natures of man so that the one nature, the pure nature, could come out and he could be who he really was, who he was created to be. He dreamt about the possibility of relieving himself from the tension and from the imprisonment of these two natures. And here's what he writes at the end of the story. It's, it's just a great one and this is a little bit lengthy here, but I want to share it with you. At the end, when he describes what happened, he says... If each nature could be housed in separate identities, life would be relieved of all that was unbearable. The unjust might go his way, delivered from his aspirations and remorse of his more upright twin. The just person could walk steadfastly and securely on his upward path, doing good things in which he found his pleasure and no longer exposed to disgrace and penitence by the hands of his extraneous evil. It was the curse of mankind that these two incongruous natures were thus bound together and continually struggling. And uh, Mark says almost the exact same thing about two natures in man in, in Mark 14, verse 38. He says, watch and pray that you might not enter into temptation. 
the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Now, there's, there's a huge difference between what Stevenson says about the two natures of man and what the Bible says about the two natures of man. And, and so we'll be sure to clarify that distinction for you. But we want to base our theology on Scripture alone. In similar fashion, you've got a lot of passages in the New Testament that talk about a, a struggle between the two natures of man. Listen to Romans chapter 7, verse 23. I see in my members another law waging war against the law of my mind. But there's actually this law, this, this war going on between uh, one nature of man and another nature of man. Ephesians chapter 6 commands us to put on the full armor of God because of the war in the heavenly places that, that is being waged on us and even against us. Uh, let me read for you this passage in Mark chapter 14. And we're going to look into the details as we go. It's uh, verse 27 through 52 is where we'll be camping out in the gospel of Mark. Verse 27 starts this way. And Jesus said to them, speaking to his disciples, you will all fall away. For it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. But after I am raised up, I will go before you to Galilee. And Peter said to him, even though they all fall away, I will not. Jesus said to him, truly, I tell you this very night before the rooster crows twice, you will deny me three times. But Peter emphatically said, if I must die with you, I will not deny you. And they all said the same. Verse 32, they went to a place called Gethsemane. And Jesus said to his disciples, sit here while I pray. And he took with him Peter, James, and John, and they began to be greatly distressed and troubled. And he said to them, my soul is very sorrowful, even till death. Remain here and watch. Going a little further, he fell on the ground and he prayed that if it were possible, the hour might pass from him. And he said, Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. Remove this cup from me, yet not what I will, but what you will. And he came and he found them sleeping. He said to Peter, Simon, are you asleep? Could you not watch for one hour? Watch and pray that you might not enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Verse 39. Again, he went away and he prayed, saying the same words. And, and again, he came and he found them sleeping. For their eyes were very heavy and they did not know how to answer him. And he came a third time and he said to them, Are you still sleeping and taking your rest? Is it not enough? The hour has come. The Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. Verse 43. Immediately while he was still speaking, Judas came, one of the twelve, and with him a crowd with swords and clubs, the chief priests and the scribes and the elders. Now the betrayer had been given them a sign saying, the one who I will kiss is the man. Seize him and lead him away under guard. And when he came, he went up to him at once and he said, Rabbi, and he kissed him. They laid hands on him and they seized him. But one who stood by drew his sword and struck the servant of the high priest and cut off his ear. Jesus said to him, have you come out? as against a robber with swords and clubs to capture me. Day after day I was with you in the temple, teaching, and you did not seize me. But let the scripture be fulfilled. And they all left him and fled. A young man followed him with nothing but a linen cloth about his body, and they seized him. But when he left the linen cloth, he ran away naked. The first thing I want to talk about this morning is... Um, the difficulty of dependence, the difficulty of depending completely on God. When Jesus talks to his disciples, he isn't exactly the most motivational speaker when this passage begins. Verse 27, Jesus says, you will all fall away. Uh, the Greek for fall away is scandalizo. You can probably hear our English word in there to scandalize or scandal. And it means that the disciples, all of them, are going to be led into sin. And it is a, this is a future tense verb. Jesus says, this is going to happen. And on top of that, it's all inclusive. Not just Peter is going to fall away. All, every disciple is going to fall away. Is, is Jesus setting them up for failure in this context? Why doesn't he say, you know, you guys are really going to be tempted to sin and to abandon me? Be strong, stay courageous, fight the temptation, do what I know is going to be hard for you to do. 
And, and part of the reason why it doesn't say that is because this is a fulfillment of Zechariah chapter 13, verse 7. This was ordained in the prophecies. But there's something deeper going on in this passage uh, and a critical principle of the Christian life as we read Mark 14. Really interesting, um, when I started watching sports when I was a little kid, uh, I got into football. And of course, I'm from Wisconsin, so I'm a huge Green Bay Packers fan, as many of you know. And when I started watching football, the greatest running back in the NFL was Barry Sanders. Right. And I know right when I mentioned Barry Sanders in Oklahoma, all the OSU fans are, are agreeing with me 100%. Barry Sanders was a running back that you weren't going to stop him. At some point in time in every single game, he was going to break loose and go for me mega yardage against the best defenses in the league. And so all the coaches, whenever Green Bay would pay, play Detroit, they beat them almost every time, but all the coaches, all the defensive players were well aware that Barry Sanders was a threat. He was going to break loose. It wasn't a question of, of if it was going to happen. It was more of a question of when it was going to happen. So all the coaches and all the defensive players in the Packers would realize, man, we are vulnerable and we are susceptible to Barry Sanders making a huge play. And they could approach their defense more strategically and more successfully because of that. There's a principle that we can gain from this text right away. And that is this. Dependence on God increases as dependence on self decreases. So the less we depend on ourselves in the Christian life, and the more that we depend upon God, we're going to have success walking this thing that we call sanctification and living for God. Corey Ten Boom's got a great quote. You never know that God is all you need until God is all you have. God is in the business of changing us. And he is not going to protect us from that which he will perfect us through. Which means that we're going to be in positions where we are vulnerable to sin. And we need to depend more and more on God. We are susceptible to sin by nature because we're human. And this is a great application with what's happening in our world right now with all the coronavirus. People are becoming dependent on something or someone other than God. And so a lot of panic is coming into the world. But when we depend more on God than on our healthcare system, than on the market and what's going on, we can have trust and we can walk faithfully with him no matter what's happening in our lives. Listen to what Peter does. Verse 29. This is a, a great great text and depiction. It says, Peter said to him, speaking of Jesus, even though they all fall away, I will not. Literally, when you read that in the text, the I is at the end of the sentence. Even though they will all fall away, not I. So this is a great comparison. Even though all those other disciples that they're just not the same caliber as I am, they're not as strong as I am, they're not as faithful as I am, even if all those other guys fall away. I'm not going to fall away because I'm different. I'm of a, a, a different, a special caliber in the Christian life. I love what one theologian says. We cannot get into a right relationship with God until we discover the fact of our bankruptcy. Look down at, at verse 31. But he said emphatically, if I must die with you, I will not deny you. That word emphatically in the text is a hapoxagama. That is the one place it occurs in all of the New Testament. Peter insists to Jesus, I'm not going to betray you. I'm not going to fall away, if, even if I have to die with you. And you see that pride ultimately comes before fall. The more that we can get ourselves out of the way, the more that we will become like God. And the first difficulty in depending on God is fighting against autonomy and self-sufficiency. We are vulnerable to sin, and we need to depend more on God because of that. The point is driven home with, with Jesus in Gethsemane, and in in this scene is just a very memorable scene of Jesus praying with his disciples in the garden. These are, these are passages that you don't have to teach that much through. You just have to read them to gain what, what the author is trying to tell us. Three times, Jesus tells his disciples, watch and pray. Watch and pray. Verses 34, 37, and 38. Three times, Jesus comes back and finds them sleeping. Verses 37, 
verse 40 and verse 41. And then you match that up with the, the prediction of the three denials of Christ. This is a very memorable passage with these sets of threes. Uh, our need for God is urgent. We must be dependent on him and the failure is when we depend too much on ourselves and we will not be successful in the Christian life. The central verse in Mark 14 is um, verse 38. And verse 38 says, Watch and pray that you might not enter into temptation. The spirit is indeed willing, but the flesh is weak. And, and the Bible often depicts this struggle, this dichotomy between the spirit and the flesh. And probably the best passage that does that is Galatians chapter 5. And, and I want to just flip to Galatians 5, verse 16. And so if you guys are reading along and following along at home in your Bibles, turn to Galatians 5 and look down at verse 16. The Apostle Paul writes this, But I say, walk in the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. Walk in the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit, and the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other, to keep you from doing the things that you want to do. So if you are being led by the Spirit, you are not under the law, and the works of the flesh are evident. And Paul goes on to list those. But then in verse 22, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And against such things, there is no law. Uh, verse 24, he, he summarizes, those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and with its desires. Principle number two this morning. Those who depend on God the most are those who question their desires the most. Those who depend on God the most question their desires the most. The desire for a good thing can actually become a bad thing if it is desired more than we desire God and our love for God. So what do we do to overcome our sinful desires? Watch and pray. Depend on God. Trust him, walk with him every single step of the way because you know that you're vulnerable and you're susceptible to sin. I'm vulnerable and susceptible. This is the difficulty of dependence. And unfortunately, the passage gets a little harder from here. Now we're going to see the difficulty turning into disaster. And verses 43 through 52 show the arrest and the betrayal of Jesus where, where this becomes an all-out abandoning of Christ by the disciples. Everything in this passage is moving to, to verse 50 in chapter 14. Mark chapter 14, verse 50, says this, and it's a very short verse in the Bible. And they all, speaking of the disciples, left him and fled. They all left him and fled. They, speaking, of course, of disciples. Here are some, some pictures I want to show you guys of Gethsemane. Uh, these are pictures that, that we were able to see when we went to Israel. And this is a very historic landmark now. If you go to the land of Israel, to Jerusalem, uh, toward the Mount of Olives, you'll see at the base of the Mount of Olives, the Garden of Gethsemane. These giant olive trees are the oldest known to man in the entire, in the entire earth right now. Carbon dating says that, that some of these trees that are still existed, existing in the Garden of Gethsemane have been alive for over a thousand years. They're probably not the original trees that were there when Jesus walked the earth and prayed in the garden, as we're reading about in Mark 14, but they are probably offshoots of those trees. Inside these massive trunks are just hollow, um, so they can't be dated with uh, just a, a pinpoint accuracy like other trees can, but, but these are massive, massive olive trees, and you can just imagine what it would be like for Jesus there in the garden in the garden saying these prayers and asking his disciples to watch and pray with him. Uh, the word Gethsemane itself comes from the Hebrew word that means oil press. Gat in Hebrew is press and Shemin is oil. This is the, Gethsemane is literally the garden of oil pressing or some people would say the place where the oil is crushed. And that's the exact same place that Jesus is crushed, but but his crushing didn't start um, in verses 43 through 52. His crushing started back in verse 36. 
In verse 36, when he is praying to the Father, he says, Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. Remove this cup from me, yet not what I will, but what you will. Some of your translations will say, if it's possible. Uh, I like the translations that go, God, all things are possible. Because we know that he is an omnipotent God. And if he wanted to do something different with Jesus in this context, he would have absolutely made that possible. He is sovereign, he is in control, and he is a powerful God. But instead, he says that it's time for Jesus to go, his son to go to the cross and to be crushed. Ultimately, Jesus says a, a prayer of perfect submission to God in this context. Even if he must suffer, the son still submits. And even if we must suffer in the Christian life, our responsibility is to submit. And many people will claim, and especially in the Tulsa area here, that this prayer that Jesus speaks in verse 36 is a weak prayer. And it's actually void of faith. Nothing could be further from the truth. A lot of people want to portray a, a, a prayer life or a relationship with God that if we pray hard enough, strong enough, or even if we believe enough, all we have to do is say the words and it shall be done. Jesus is saying, God, if there's another way that this can happen, let it be done. Instead, uh, that prayer isn't answered and he commits himself, he submits himself to the will of the Father. Listen to what one commentator says about this passage in this prayer. He says, herein lies faith, the ability to request openly another destiny that the one God has chosen, but ultimately submitting to God's will, whatever this may involve, ultimately submitting to God's will, whatever it may involve. It was God's will that Jesus would be crushed for the salvation of many. It was God's will that Jesus would be betrayed with a kiss. Look at verse 44. Now, when the betrayer had given them a sign saying, the one whom I kiss is the man, seize him and lead him away under guard. And when he came, he went up to him at once and he said, Rabbi, and he kissed him. In order to understand the kiss, you have to understand darkness in the garden. It would have been very dark at that time in the ancient Near East in the first century. There was no way the soldiers would have known who Jesus was, even if they were a little bit familiar with him. The kiss was absolutely essential because of the darkness. And normally, people would have, have greeted people with a kiss at this time. Uh, two things stand out in this text. Usually, it was the rabbi who kissed the disciple or his follower, not the follower who kissed the rabbi. This is a very much a, a social insult for Jesus to take this step, or for Judas to take this step, excuse me, and, uh, and to kiss Jesus instead of vice versa. But secondly, the Greek uses an intensive form of this verb to kiss. Um, we might say that, that Judas exaggerated the kiss. Maybe he held on, he brought the drama of the kiss out in front of everybody else. A greeting that normally meant acceptance and peace here meant betrayal in a very dramatic and memorable way even. One time that Jesus was, was greeted with a kiss, this is the only time that he was greeted with a kiss in all of the Gospels, and I think that's significant. Everything, of course, like I said before, is moving here to verse 50. Literally, they abandoned him and fled. All of them abandoned Jesus and fled. That word abandon takes us back to the, to the Old Testament. And it is a, a clear depiction of covenant unfaithfulness by the people of God. Israel, when they sinned, we saw this not too long ago in our Judges series, Judges chapter 2. When Israel sins, all of the people did what was evil in the sight of the Lord, and they abandoned the Lord their God. That's the same Greek word in the Greek version of the Old Testament. And it means that they were no longer faithful to their promise, to keep covenant with their covenant-keeping God. And what happened in the Old Testament when the people failed to keep covenant with God? What did that mean? That meant covenant curse. That meant they were going to experience hardship, suffering, and difficulty. Here, it's, it's really interesting. Um, Jesus is the one that experiences covenant curse for the people, and he doesn't deserve it. The people, the disciples, are the one that experience covenant blessing, and in fact, they deserve the curse instead. 
What a great picture of the gospel that even though we abandon Christ, even though we're sinful and we do things that are that are against what he calls us to do and to love him, he still loves us. Even though we at times are faithless, he is faithful because he cannot deny himself. And the gospel is a, a great substitution. And Jesus did for us what we couldn't do for ourselves, but he also gave us blessing when all we deserved was curse. You see the grace of God in a magnificent way in this passage. Verse 51 and 52 are are probably two of the most mysterious verses in this passage. Verse 51, a young man followed him with nothing but a linen cloth about his body, and they seized him. But he left the linen cloth, and he ran away naked. But who's that guy? What's going on in this text? Some people suggest, we, we really don't know. Some suggest that he is a seeker of Jesus living in the area. Maybe he was one of his followers that's not known by name in the context of Mark. Some people think it's Lazarus. He shows up just unnamed in Mark's context. One of the, maybe one of the disciples is depicted dramatically uh, running away and abandoning Christ in this way. Some people even suggest this might be an angel that came on the scene or, or Mark himself. This is an autobiographical account of Mark, John Mark, who, who comes to Jesus and, and he flees in the span of his arrest. Here's what we know. Nakedness, not only in the Gospels, but also in all of the Bible, is a sign of shame. And it's a sign of guilt, even. What's this man doing? He is running away from Jesus. So here's a guy who is shamed in his nakedness, running away from Jesus instead of running toward him, perhaps maybe when he needed the most, needed him the most. He chose shame over faithfulness. And again, compare Jesus in this context. Jesus is the one in, in just a, another chapter. We're going to see him naked and shamed on the cross. He willingly took on shame. This man unwillingly takes on shame. He bore our sins on the cross and, and bore himself naked for everybody to see, to pay for sins. Here's a man that unwillingly runs away naked, and he was forced to, to save his own life. Just the, the comparison of the two people in this account is just, it's drastic and it brings out the richness of the gospel. I think it's great. As we, as we close, just want to give a couple points of application. Uh, last week, we said we wanted to focus on worship. And what is worship as we close the gospel of Mark? We talked about all true worship has to have an object. And when that object isn't God, isn't Christ, that means that we need to repent of our sin and realize we're worshiping someone or something else that's not him. We also talked about the foundation of worship being the glory of God and the holiness of God. But today I want to focus on worship in terms of the will of God. Scott Harrell wrote a book on, uh, on the church, on ecclesiology, and he defined the church as this. He said, the church is professing believers in Jesus Christ who have been baptized practice the Lord's Supper, and organize to do God's will. The church is professing believers in Jesus Christ who have been baptized, practice the Lord's Supper, and organize to do God's will. And he took that definition from Charles Ryrie's basic theology. Historically, churches have gathered together to perform God's will under one of two principles. Uh, you either function under a regulative principle as a church or a normative principle. The regular principle says this, true worship only involves components expressly prescribed in scripture, but forbids anything else that's not. The normative principle says Christians can incorporate forms and practices not forbidden in scripture. The normative principle would allow a little bit more freedom in worship, especially as it pertains to corporate gatherings. The regulative principle is, is pretty uh, definitive that says, if it's in the Bible expressly stated, we can do it, but we're not going to do anything else. It's important to know where you fall in those two things for corporate gatherings of worship and the will of God. But even more important is carrying out the will of God in your life. And we're at this, this point right now where we are not gathering face to face to worship corporately and it's just a, it's going to be a weird Sunday for me. Um, 
I'm not going to have the joy and the experience of, of seeing my brothers and sisters in Christ like I normally do. Um, however, we can still worship and carry out the will of God. And here's what we have to say about God's will and worship individually, daily, as we live for him in a, in a worship lifestyle. There is almost always going to be a struggle between what we want to do and what God wants us to do. There's always going to be a struggle between our will and God's will. This passage seems to say, at least from Peter's perspective, when we are the most confident in our own self-will, it's going to cause the most crushing and the most pain in our life. From Jesus' perspective, the one who is the most submitted to God is the one who is the most conformed ultimately to his will. Jesus worships with a high view of God's will and God's sovereignty. But he also worships with a high view of God's goodness. That he will trust him, even if it pains him, even if he is crushed, that that might in fact be the will of God. And he is still going to worship. Uh, Job 1 comes to mind when it talks about the Lord is given, the Lord is taken away. But blessed be the name of the Lord. The one thing I want to leave you guys with this morning is, is simply this. Living for the will of God means no matter what happens to you, we can trust him, we can live for him, and we can worship him because he is a good and he is a sovereign God. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, again, just um, thank you for your goodness to us, Lord. We thank you that, that we can worship you no matter where we are all the time. Our whole life is designed and created to worship you and who you are. Lord, help us to, uh, to be people who are aligned with your will instead of our will, who give up our self-sufficiency and depend completely on you every step of the way. Lord, we ask you for the strength and the courage to do so. And we thank you for your grace and we thank you for your love for us. Uh, keep us safe. Keep our church safe and healthy in the days ahead. Help us to be very wise. And, um, and just concerned and, and pray, we pray for those um, who need healing at this time. Lord, we ask uh, for your goodness and grace to go with us, to be with us. And uh, thank you for this time that we've had together. It's in the name of your Son and by our Spirit we pray. Amen.